technology to do what I want today. Good gracious. Um, talking about reptiles, and we had done um, a segue. Gracious, I don't have anything. Into talking about um, the dinosauria and sort of the end of the reptile rule and how sort of our archosaurs, right, that being our crocodilia and our dinosauria, led us into the other end of things, right, which in this case is the end of the reptiles um, and the rise of the other half of the archosauria, which in this case would be the aves. <clears throat> so, as we get into here, we have some other key important archosaur features, okay. which seem, in some cases, to be a little counterintuitive, because remember that aves, right, our other class that we're going to segue into here, are also archosaurs, and for some of these, these are hard to see. Okay, so as we start talking about these, remember we're looking at synapomorphies. These are shared, whew, shared characteristics. So everybody down the line to our crocodiles would have had these as archosaurs. Okay, not all of the other reptiles, right? Just crocodiles. And then our aves and our mammals will have these, right? That's all we have left because we are down the road. Okay, so. First thing that we see, which is going to become very important, is that our teeth are set differently. Okay, instead of being embedded in gums, which was important, and we saw that pop up um, in our chondrixes, they're embedded into actual sockets, right? They're embedded into the skull themselves. This is one of the reasons that crocodiles don't lose their teeth, right? And one of the reasons mammals are so successful as well. Right, we have such a, a substantial bite force. Right, so literally, socket teeth. Right, so key here, right, we tend to keep our teeth when we're feeding. Okay. Now this is true for aves as well, despite the fact as we'll find that aves don't keep their teeth usually. Right, so this is what we mean by this last bullet point, is they are secondarily toothless, meaning that they actually do have teeth as embryo, which is neat. But as we know and as we'll find, right, birds don't keep their teeth, which is good because it's like nightmare fuel we just don't need in our lives. <coughs> so if we get embryonic birds or if we take embryology, this is something you can see, which is cool and horrifying, but birds only have beaks. I do have an article posted under our bird week. We're a little behind, so you have to pop back. Um, where scientists are able to force birds to keep their teeth turned on. So there's chickens with teeth in a lab. Also nightmare fuel, very cool and weirdly terrifying. So this is a thing that birds have. It's just not something we normally see because teeth are heavy. And this is one of the things we'll talk about, which is why they don't um, developmentally keep them. Okay, other things that we don't normally see but are very important when it comes to our archosaurs. <clears throat> so we have um, what are called fenestrae. Okay, so we see here that the definition of fenestrae is one of those fancy anatomy terms. It just means holes in your bones. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. We have a whole bunch of these, and before us, right, there's others, other fenestrae that do exist. But there's two new ones that came about. Now, in particular, this mandibular one, meaning there's one in our jaw, and anti-orbital, okay, meaning right in front of our eye. So this one here. Okay, so we got two new bones in our skulls, two new holes in the bones in our skull. It's going to be a long day, guys. <laughs> okay, so we've talked in the past about having 
sticky outy parts in our bones and how that's useful, right? We talked about like the protrusion on our spines and how that can help and how other extra muscles can help. Well, we've not talked about holes before. So how can holes help us? Okay, so it, it is surface area. So what kinds of things can we stick through this surface area? What might this be a bonus for? Nerves. So we can put nerves and blood vessels through here. Okay, so this is one big bonus. Hey, what else might this might be beneficial for? Rest, maybe? <laughs> so it can be good for grip for muscles, but usually protrusions are good for muscles. So we've talked about holes in bones before. What else was holes in bones good for? Back when we talked about holy bones. Weight reduction. Okay, so these are the two big things we see, right? This is good for putting nerves and blood vessels through. And this is going to make our face way less. <clears throat> okay, speaking of stuff on bones. Okay. Our archosaurs and beyond also have one really special feature about them that sets them apart from those who got to live through some of our extinction events that we talked about on Friday. Okay. In particular, what's called the fourth trochanter. All right, so here we are on the femur. So this is a big old bump on the femur, okay? A very large bump on the femur. So what are big bumps good for? Muscle connections, right? Good. So on these organisms, we have huge ridges on our legs for additional muscle connections. And this is lacking on many or most of the organisms that did not make it through these extinction events. So these are organisms that are going to have much thicker leg muscles that allow for better running, right, better movement. They're going to be able to migrate, move further, right, walk longer. So when we're talking about access or ability to find food, these guys are going to have a huge advantage at that, right? Because they're going to be able to go literally and figuratively go the distance. Okay. Any questions about those? All right, so more hidden than many of our synapomorphies have been up to this point, but no less important. So the trochanters just help to move faster, that's why they... Yep, bigger leg muscles for better distance or speed, yeah. And that's a big advantage, particularly when we're talking about needing to have significantly larger territories very suddenly. Bless you. Good gracious. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> we all know I have a thing for birds, <laughs> and it's a weird relationship. <clears throat> so, there's a lot we could talk about with birds. 
Um, I'm sure you guys saw at the beginning of the class, I had to slim it down a little bit because boy are we running out of time and I want to make sure we get to talk about mammals, right? Certainly it would not be a zoology class if we didn't make it there. So I have to think critically about the things that we can talk about. But in general, anyway, the main things that I want to talk about when we're talking about the unique characteristics with birds, whether it's a normal ear or not, has to do with flying and singing, which are the two things that really set birds apart in general from most of the other organisms really that exist. So what we're going to talk about in this first section, you see I have part one listed, is how is it that birds do what they do in order to cope with the demands of flight and how is it that they get their uh, feathery butts into the air. So that's really going to be the core when we're talking about unique characteristics. It's going to be very myopic or uh, narrowly focused on characteristics for flight. There is going to be a second part. This will definitely be on next class where we look at birdsong itself. Right? Narrowly, how does birdsong exist? And then how do birds use this song to tell each other apart? So we'll look at that as well. So let's start at the top then here and look look at um, in more detail because we've gotten to see this a little bit in lab. Uh, how is it that birds do the whole flight thing? So one thing that you guys got to deal with very specifically okay, was the first thing birds have to worry about as they take off is they need a lot of strength to do so. <coughs> and we need this a couple of ways, right? <clears throat> the first of which being that the actual strength or the motion of doing so, right, can physically tear your body apart, right? We're putting all of the strength, the flapping of the wings, on a few parts of your body. And if they're not careful, you can overstrain and break those bones. So we need to make sure that we reinforce all of the places that we're putting that strain. So we dealt with this directly in lab, the reinforcement of these bones where that strain, strain is being put. Okay? So many bones in the bird's body are strengthened or more specifically fused. So the main one we saw is called the keel, which is fundamentally a sternum, right? We also have a sternum, but our sternum looks sad and small. So our sternum fundamentally just helps fuse and protect our ribs, okay? Well, their sternum or keel, right, because it looks very much like the edge or front of a boat, which is also called a keel, that's where its name comes from is both the fusion of the sternum and several other large bones in the front of their body, right? So if you remember handling this in class, it's very large, it's big. Stop doing that. Okay. And it also protrudes out quite substantially, right? So it ends up being this vertical mass with which, as we remember, the pectoral muscles, which are the major muscles they use, same muscles we use to move our arms in and out, are the same muscles they're going to use for flapping. So they have a lot of space, right, protrusions for muscle connection. This bone fusion is going to become very important as well, right? Because <coughs> as we think about wanting to lift our butts off the ground, we know weight is ultimately going to be a problem here. So as we fuse bones, we can get more strength with less total number. So as we look at our bird's body here, as I clean it up a little, okay, particularly in its core thoracic and abdominal area, right, we do have 
less total bones. Our keel has been fused. We also see that it's um, lumbar area, right, this back, tail, and uh, <clears throat> abdominal area for its spine is also fused, right? So we can get one long hollow bone instead of a bunch of small heavy bones. Now we can't do that for everything. Certainly we're going to have a bunch of small neck bones, a bunch of small arm bones. We're going to have to have some flexibility. Everything can't be fused, okay? But if it's going to be weight bearing, fusion is going to be the way to go to help give it strength. Now, just like before, hey, we and everything else above water has to worry about weight to some degree, right? Because <clears throat> we have to be concerned about being able to move our body at all with the issues of gravity. Birds have an even larger problem because they don't have to worry just about dragging their butts across the hallway, right, they have to get themselves in the air. And so part of the reason fusing their bones is so important is because most of their bones are actually hollow, right? So they've taken this spongy idea to its most extreme version. So as we look on the right-hand side, both to the diagram and to the actual issues of bones that I have up here, okay, the vast length of bones that our birds have quite literally have nearly nothing in them, right? Some of the edges, right, where the bones are going to make connections or articulations with other bones, there will be some scaffolding in there to help them not splinter. But otherwise, by and large, as we look at this bottom image, they are quite literally hollow, right? So many um, different groups of humans have been known to literally turn them into flutes or wind chimes when they get a hold of them. They make a nice tinkling sound, <clears throat> okay? So much so that we know, for example, that you can hold even the largest birds, like falcons and eagles, up on your arm, and stand there at least, it'll be a little heavy, but you can hold it. <clears throat> For example, right, red eagles and falcons are about the size of something like a bulldog, okay? But ain't no way, right, you're gonna stand here with a bulldog up on your arm, okay? No matter how fit you are, that would be quite the weightlifting technique. Okay, so this is the big difference that these hollow bones are going to make, right? Captain Chubby here, okay, <clears throat> no matter how well-sized he is, his bones are going to make him too heavy for you to hold, and that's the difference in just the weight of the bones that are going to make between our mammal dog and our Aves bird or falcon. It, so, yes. So, her, uh, so Maria's note is that a lot of the bones felt like they were basically cartilage. And that's really much of the case, that they're hollow and on their ends probably were, in fact, just cartilage or held together by just cartilage, right? Because cartilage is also very, very light. So, in many of these cases, may have been just cartilage. Okay, any question about birdie structure? Hi. So that's not so bad, right? We actually got to see most of the inside of our bird and its bones, for better or worse, when we were taking them apart. So let's take a second to think about bird wing structure 
or specifically the creation of what we call the airfoil. The airfoil is the production of air pressure around the wing that allows the bird to get lit. <clears throat> so the bird needs two things to happen in order for it to get in the air, right? We need lift. Oh, rats are frazzle. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, so lift is the up, right? And we need propulsion or push, right? Because we can't just get up and hover. We also need to go somewhere. So then we need forward. Okay, so this occurs with two things as our bird is moving. So thanks to the shape of the wing, we're going to get low pressure. And this is the same way an airplane wing works. We're going to create low pressure just above the wing. This creates kind of a suction. And this is going to give us lift. And our high pressure below is going to create the push. And this is both going to give us buoyancy and directionality. So here's what ends up happening. So here, uh, this is going to be my bird wing from the side. right? So we're going to imagine this is the back end. This is my front. Right, and so we're looking at the bird from a side view. So we would imagine here's my bird head. Very small bird head, right? But we're basically looking at it going this way, right? So here's my bird's shoulder here. So as my bird is going to fly this direction, or my goal is to fly to the right of my, that's your right as well, right? <laughs> to the right of my screen, right? It's going to get wind or air, right? Pushing back in the opposite direction. So what we want to do is consider then as our, well, headless bird now the way I've drawn this, <clears throat> is proceeding forward and the wind is pushing back. Don't worry, this doesn't get horrifically physics-y. <clears throat> What is going to happen to its wing, wings up, right? <clears throat> and how does this help get it up and forward? Okay, everybody see what we're looking at with this wing before I start adding stuff to it? Okay, so here's my wing. I'm moving up and forward. So what's happening to me? <clears throat> okay, the first thing that happens is my air is coming in. Right, and the air is going to come across what's called the lower camber. So the word camber on a wing just means curve. So if I imagine here air hitting my camber or curve, I don't know that I want to use blue, I guess. All right, so here's my wind. Meow, right? Man, had sound effects and everything, right? Here's my wind. I'm coming in, hitting the wing. Okay, so I'm going to hit that front curvature of that wing, my front camber. Okay, so the wing, the wind can't go through the wing, right? So it's going to break at that curve. So the first thing we're going to look at is when it breaks down. Okay, so I hit that wing and the curve or camber of that wing is going to force the air down. And when I hit the camber, as we look at the shape of my wing, okay, what this does is causes the air to get kind of pushed, right? I'm getting pushed or smashed up under this wing. Okay, and we can see that from my picture here. 
It's not a lot, okay? But it's just enough that we can see and we're kind of getting pushed, pushed. So we're building up, right? We can imagine with that bird wing, right, there's that sort of shape to it underneath. It almost looks like there's a hollow underneath it, right, that kind of catches and builds. Okay, so this is the key here. Is we're basically going to pull, catch, and push all that air into that space. So this is the first key, right? Remember, our goal is to get high air pressure in there. So as all of this wind is coming in, right, we're pushing that air in and we're capturing it in that space, that divot, under my wing pits. This is our lift. Okay. Okay, our propulsion is going to come from the downstrokes. Okay. Okay, when we push the air away. Right, now we're just catching the air. I'm trying to think because every time you see a bird, you see them like kind of before they fly, they're like fighting it and then they, <laughs> and they go. Like, Takeoff is a whole beast, yeah. Or they just jump and then fly. <laughs> okay, so step one, we've created a pile of air underneath us. So we have high air pressure under here. Okay, A. Okay. Right, big old high air pressure pile. I'm going to leave that listed there. Okay, the next thing that's happening is we follow our air. <clears throat> I'm drawing, definitely drawing. As we come into this camber, okay, the top of my wing is rounded. Got a big old camber, a big curve up at the top, right? So I'm not going to trap any air up here, okay? I'm going to deflect any air that decides it's going to go across the top. So because the air isn't getting trapped, right, we're going to flick away, flick, right, deflect, flick, okay. This big old curve isn't going to let air just sit across the top of my wing. So all of the air pressure across the top is very low, right? It's been flicked away. Okay, so this is the key with how we're going to stay in the air. As I'm a bird and I'm moving, or I'm trying to get off the ground, <clears throat> the use of that slight suction from above, right, that low pressure I've created above my wing, okay, and the collective push, right, or pile of air that I've now smashed below my wing, right, is going to give me that lift to get up, okay, and this works for both takeoff, okay, so when you see them fluttering around, they're trying to create this, and while they're in the air. So when I'm going to try to propel forward, okay, any of those movements forward is either angling my wing down, Like week 13, and I still can't remember to switch to the drawing function. So I can angle the front of my wing down, right? So I can control the direction of where that high pressure air is getting pushed out. Or when I flap my wings, right, I'm pushing that high pressure air away from me. 
in a very specific direction. Much like our caudal fin worked when it was pushing away water. Right? I've just pre-stored my air under my wing before I push it away. All right, so the key to everything is having low above and that store of high below. Okay, this is why it's always important as well for birds to keep moving, right? So we always have wind, whoops, get rid of this, continuously moving over our camber, right? Which will constantly refill both the high pressure and the low pressure sections. All right, if the bird stops, right, it isn't flapping, right? Hummingbirds constantly flap, which will refill. Okay. <clears throat> Otherwise, if our bird stops, right, we won't get wind moving over our camber, so the refilling stops, which will cause our bird to drop. Or land, more appropriately. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So Maria has pointed out this works very much like an airplane, which has, instead of constant wind, has turbines right in front of their wings, which fuels this air pressure constantly. They have exactly the same things. If you look at an airplane wing, right, it's the exact same shape with a large curve up front. The curve up top is very large, and the curve underneath, right, is concave like that. So their turbines fuel this exact same air pressure system. Not that any of us get to fly anymore, but next time you're on an airplane, you can peek at this exact same shape and setup. Okay, any questions about our airfoil? Yes, fly your birds. And don't forget if you're online, I cannot see the chat, so please make sure that you pop on your mic for me. Okay, so as we mentioned here, as we're doing this, how we tip our wings or flap our wings then can modify how fast I'm going and the direction I'm moving, right? Because it's all about where I'm pushing out or how much of that high pressure air I'm pushing out to get that propulsion. So, for example, if you imagine something like a falcon diving, right, all they've done is pulled their wings in tight and pushed their head down. So, all at once, right, they've pushed all of their airfoil out, right, giving themselves a jet of propulsion combined with a free fall, which is how they move so fast. Clever little things. Murdery little things. <clears throat> okay. Any questions about bird shape? Okay, bird weight or bird wing type in the way that it creates its airfoil for flight. You know, certainly there are, of course, more pieces to flight and takeoff, but this is a very general how do birds not fall out of the sky kind of thing. Quick 
pop across while we're paused and also do that. <clears throat> Okay, so next I'm going to take a very light look at feathers. Um, I pulled some out of this because we didn't get a chance to look at this at lab either. Um, but I still want to talk about the importance of feathers to bird flight. So the big key I want to focus on here is there are ultimately two kinds of feathers for bird flight. <clears throat> Um, which are called primaries and secondaries. So primaries are the, the keys to being able to take off in flight. Okay, so these are the ones we say are inserted into the hand bones themselves. So as we look at a bird's wing, okay, most of the bird's wing is the arm bone. This is all arm, right? So the stuff I have in orange at the end is the hand, okay? So where you guys were looking at the patagium, right? That's this part, the membrane there that makes the patagium. Okay, all of that is in the arm, right? That's fundamentally the elbow. Okay, there's another one here in the armpit. All of that stuff is basically to make sure the bird doesn't overstretch its wing, right, and bust something, right, because then it wouldn't be able to retract it or swoop it anymore, fundamentally grounding it for good. All of that's important, okay, particularly while in flight, okay, None of that is important for the actual taking off bit. So our primaries exist in the hand. And these are really stiff feathers. All right, so we can even tell from this questionable diagram as we look at these feathers versus these feathers. My primary feathers are very stiff. And they tend to be very asymmetrical. And we can tell that as well. Right? These feathers tend to have the vein, the part that looks like you would write with a quill, okay? tend to be on one side, while the rest of the feather or the floofy part falls to one side or the inside. Okay? These feathers are the pushy offy feathers. They need them to take off. And these are really important for major propulsion. Okay. Um, these are all found in the hand bone, so quite literally from the wrist to what would be the finger, which on a bird is much longer than yours or mine, <laughs> but still where they're found. If you have had or know someone that's had a pet bird or had a bird bought at a pet store, like a parrot, these birds tend to, at least while they're at the pet store, have what's called a wing clipping, okay? Which means, please forgive me, fake bird. They're going to take like a toenail clipper. And clip off the tips of all of these wings, or these feathers. I want wings too. And there aren't nerves here, per se but it renders the bird flightless, okay? Usually you only have to lose like 10% of these feathers in order to be rendered flightless, okay? which from us makes us jerks, I think. In the wild, right, that would be like a bite, right? If a predator caught the tip of your wing, got to get it out of its mouth or you're going to be grounded and doomed. The primaries. We'll talk about the secondaries in a second. But if your goal is to keep the bird from flying, you clip the primaries. The secondaries, keep flight, the, the secondaries keep you in flight. So the stuff I have in red here are secondaries. 
space and it'll be illuminated in the next slide as well. So let's clean this up here. My primary feathers, let's see where would these end? Are the green, so to the right of the green bar. Ish. Okay, so much stiffer. Okay. They don't matter as much to keep you gliding once you're in the air, but they are grossly important to get you there in the first place. The other side will be the secondary, the stuff that would be inside your armpit feathers. Okay. So we're going to talk about the secondaries here in a hot second. Do the primaries make sense? Everybody see what we're saying about those? With the ground that they have for the whatever ground, it, it would be in the, in our, like that, like Girl, yes. For, for all English, it's fine. <laughs> The primary feathers will be here, and then this is the rest of the... Correct, yeah. So the secondaries go from the wrist all the way to the armpit. <laughs> I can't either. I'm supposed to be running the class, so don't worry. <laughs> Actually, let's see if I'll leave that up. Nope. So... For our primaries, there are a few other pieces that are really important to some birds. Uh, in that, they can be what's called slotted. So remember, these are just the wrist feathers. Oh, that one's probably more like this. Okay. So for particularly predatory birds, okay, so the falcon in here being the, or the vulture, excuse me, up here being one of the larger birds, and so it has larger feathers, primary only feathers can be slotted. Ooh, I thought that said 950 and I thought I'd screwed everything up. Um, meaning that these primary feathers have notches or gaps in the actual feathers. So we have some gapping both between the feathers, which we see here. Okay, so there's much bigger space here than we saw in the last image. And that the feathers themselves have some notches in them, which we can see here. Okay, what this allows for is some air to pass through between the feathers themselves. And when air is passing between these tip feathers, which we normally won't want, and we'll talk about, about the secondaries, we want that to be a very clean sheet. With our primaries, if we allow at the tip of our wings some air to pass through, this allows the feathers to twist a little so we can get basically like hairpin turns for the birds. And this is important when we're thinking about things like a vulture, right, which might want to make a quick twist or turn as it's spiraling to come down to a prey. Or something like a falcon, right, which might make a quick twist or turn as it's chasing a prey item, which may be much smaller and attempting to outmaneuver it. So when we're talking about directional changes, we're really talking about quick turns, which on a very big bird, right, would otherwise be very difficult to do. Okay, we will finish up birds on Monday. 
starting with our secondary feathers and comparing them to the functionality of our primary feathers, and then finish up by looking at some bird songs. Correct. Next week is your last week of regular classes, right? This is why you have your lab exams next week. <clears throat> so the week after that then will be finals week. Friday, right? You have Monday through Friday to engage with your lab exam. And I'll make sure to harass y'all about it all week, so there won't be <laughs> any way that you can forget it. For the lecture, I have to look. So you will, at, you will have two days to do it, um, which is far more than you'll need. But hmm? it, it, it should say on the syllabus if I did my due diligence. Um, but yeah, so Maria says the syllabus says it's Tuesday through Wednesday, but there is there should be two days for it. I have this, apparently it's Saturday according to me, so that's good. I am totally remiss, everyone. I'm sorry if you've been waiting on me. Thank you so much for your patience. Once you have finished your stockative, you are free to go. You guys are awesome. <laughs> I'm afraid my brain is half with you today.